So I'm a medical school professor. I'm very invested in, in teaching anatomy to medical students. I'm not going to be able to make you into medical students in a one hour period. So I'm going to limit the anatomy I'm going to talk about to just the skeleton. Just the skeleton. So what you see here are lots of bones. And I'm going to talk about all of the different bones so you get some familiarity with the skeleton. After all, Halloween wasn't that long ago, right? So when you see something like this, I hope you don't only think of Halloween, but you should be thinking about the bones inside your body as if it were a beautiful seashell. Don't think of it only as death, because this is inside you right now. Right? You're all carrying a skull inside you. It's not something scary. You all have it. Look at your neighbor next to you. There's a skull there. Okay? It's not Halloween. So when you see something like this, okay, I think of this the way I might think of a beautiful seashell that I find on the beach. You know, like a beautiful abalone shell or a conch shell or a, a beautiful scallop shell. These shells are gorgeous to look at, but you really can't see them and appreciate them unless the snail die. So when I see a beautiful seashell and I show it to someone, the reaction usually isn't, ew, dead snail. It's usually, wow, what a pretty seashell. So when I show a skull to you, I don't want you to go, ew, dead person. I want you to think, beautiful bony structure inside the head that you all have that is functional. So I'm going to tell you a few fun things about all of their different bones. We're going to start with the skull. So I'm going to bring the skull over. By the way, we have a whole articulated skeleton here from one of the classrooms. It looks like you guys had a test, maybe, because there's all these little pink things all over, all over the skull here. So maybe some of you know what the names of some of these bones are. <laughs> all right, so I've got this wonderful document camera over here. So whatever I show here is going to be magnified up there so that you can all see all the different things. So let's see. Come on, camera. Turn on. Yes. Okay. So what it's showing you right now is, is a skull over here. I have to make it stay still for a minute because as soon as I move it, it gets all fuzzy. This is a skull from an adult, and it has this brown color to it because it was buried originally and dug out of the ground. It wasn't prepared the way a white bony skull would be. When you normally see bones, it's actually not white because it has marrow in it, and marrow gives it some coloring. And then if you bury bone in the ground, it picks up some of the colors of the things that are in the ground. The dirt, the decomposing leaves, and anything else that might be in the ground adds color to it. So if you want to make bone white, you actually have to bleach it. But if you're really looking at the bones of an animal, let's say you've eaten a piece of steak and it has that T-bone in it, right? You know what that T-bone is? Anybody know? It's actually part of your backbone, but it's cut in half, and it gives it a T-shape because of the way it's cut. And we'll look at backbones in a minute. But if you look at that bone, it's actually not really white. It's sort of an off-white, grayish color. And it looks kind of white after you cook the steak because some of the fats have actually dissolved out of the bone at that point when it's been cooked. So let's take a look at this skull. I leave it still, hopefully it'll focus. But it's really bright. Okay. So it has this part that I can open and close here. This is the mandible. Oh, wow. That really dark. <laughs> oh, yes, that lighting is probably better for here. Thank you. Okay, so this part that I'm opening and closing here, this is called the mandible. This is a separate bone. It has teeth on it. And you can tell how old somebody is simply by counting the teeth that are in their mouth, assuming they didn't have any teeth pulled is you always have to account for that. And the way we look at how old someone is, is we start with the teeth that are in the front. Let's see if I can get this to show the front a little bit. There we go. So these two front teeth here, these are called the incisors. This one here, and this one here. And so this is the midline of the face, right here, right between these two. And what you do is you divide the face into a left and right side, and just count the teeth on one side, and either only on the top or only on the bottom. And the formula for an adult is to have two incisors, and here's one, and here's two, and one canine, which is this tooth right over here, which in some people is very long. It looks kind of like a dog, like a fang. You know, it can stick out really long, like kind of a vampire-looking tooth. 
Then you move over to these two. These are called premolars. So we've got one, two premolars. And then we have the ones that really tell us how old we are. And those are the molars. These are the big grinding teeth in the very back of the skull. So we have the first molar, and then a second molar, and in some people, a third molar. But it depends on your age. Because the first molar erupts when you're six years old. So if the skull only had one molar, we would know that that person died when they were six years old. If there's a second molar, then they made it to 12 years old. Because that's when the second molar comes out. And then if the third molar comes out, that's called the wisdom tooth. That usually comes out right about when you graduate high school or go to college, around 18 years old. That's when the third molar comes out. So this skull, which is a plastic skull, is molded based on a real skull of somebody who did not yet reach 18 years of age. So probably someone close to your age didn't have that third molar yet. But if we look at this skull, which is from a full adult, and we count the number of teeth, we start here in the midline, we've got two incisors, one canine, two premolars, one, two molars, and you think, oh, this person didn't reach 18. But remember, they could have lost a tooth. And if we look back here, there's some damage in that skull, right back in here where it looks like a tooth may have come out. So just to be sure, we've got to count the teeth in the other parts of the skull. So let's start with the bottom. Two incisors, one canine, two premolars, and six-year molar, 12-year molar, and there it is, right on the end, the 18-year molar. And we can do the same on the other side of the skull, just to be sure. Let's see if our counting is right. And we start here with our incisor, two incisors, one canine, two premolars, and six-year molar, 12-year molar, 18-year molar, or wisdom tooth. Same thing on the bottom. Two incisors, one canine, two premolars, and then six-year, 12-year, 18-year. So this person definitely made it past 18 years, and how much older than 18 years really depends on how it's supposed to happen. We're opening it up. Okay? It's just a little skip. It depends on how flat the teeth are. Okay? So if you look at the teeth here, you see how flat these are? Look at that. It's really sharply flat right there. See that tooth right there? So if you look at the edge here, they're very, very, very flat. Let's take a look at this one's jaw doesn't come off, so I'm going to get the jaw from this one, skull here. And let's compare it to these teeth. And we're going to put them, let's see, side by side like this. Okay. I don't know if you can see that, but there are lots of bumps on these teeth. And when I turn it sideways, like that, let's see if we can get it to line up right. A little bit harder to see it, but there are little bumps in here. So my fingernail is going into a divot and coming back out again, and then going into another divot and coming back out. And so these divots indicate how worn the teeth are. And somebody with a very young skull, those divots will actually be very pronounced. But as they get older, they start wearing down the teeth. And so those little valleys between the parts of the teeth become much more flattened. And you, can, you can kind of see those little divots right inside here. See that right in there? These little divots in there? So it looks like there's a cross pattern going across the tooth front to back and side to side like that, crossing in half. And that tells me that's a pretty young tooth. Whereas if you look at this tooth, it's stained. So you can see the cross pattern in it, but it's actually completely flat. If you run your finger over the top of it, which you can't do, so I'll do it for you, you'll see that this is very, very flat. And when we turn it up this way, you can see it, there's absolutely no bumps on it at all. It's really worn out. Now, if you're a vegetarian, who here is a vegetarian? One, two, three, four, five, only five people in this whole audience are vegetarians. Wow, you really are in a longhorn state. Okay, so 
Vegetarians wear your, you wear your teeth out faster than everybody else. The reason is because vegetable material is full of fiber, and that fiber actually wears on the teeth. And so people on an old vegetarian diet are going to have older looking teeth than people on who are on an old meat diet because they wear the teeth a lot faster. You need the sharp edges of the teeth to, to grate up and tear up flesh if you're eating meat. But you need to grind against the flatter surface if you're grinding a vegetable material. And so the teeth tend to wear down, kind of like a, a millstone. They're grinding against each other all the time. They're not trying to shear and bite little pieces off. They're just grinding. And so they grind down after a while. OK, more fun things about the skull. Let's take a look at the front of the skull. Okay, there's the nose hole. Everybody see that? So when you look at someone, but there's no bone in that part that sticks out. That's all supported by cartilage. And that's one of the reasons it's really easy to break a nose, but it's also really easy to put it back in place because it's just cartilage. So you can just twist it back and sit it in its little spot, and most of the time it will heal. Unless they've broken the base of that nose, which inside here is actually supported by bone. So in here where I stuck my finger, there's a piece of bone in here. You see that in the middle? And that divides this area where you breathe in, the nostrils, into left and right sides. So air passes on either side of it, and as it goes on either side, it goes across these other little projections that are coming in from the sides, and add more surface area to the inside of the nose. And all of those projections that add surface area allow you to warm and humidify the air that you breathe in, so it's not really dry. And here you don't have to worry about warm except maybe today, because for some reason you guys had frost today. <coughs> it's weird, you know, like that's my weather from New York. I think it came and followed me here. But you're not supposed to have frost, it's Texas. You're supposed to have hot weather here, right? So really you just have to worry about humidifying the air. So all of these extra surfaces have mucous membrane on it, which is wet surface, kind of like the inside of your cheek. And that allows you to add moisture to the air so when you breathe it in, your lungs aren't burning from the dryness of it. Hey, these are the eye sockets. Right here, see where I'm... Let's see if I can get this centered more. There we go. Okay, where I'm putting my fingers now, these are the eye sockets. And in the very back of the eye sockets are a bunch of cracks. Those little cracks in the back allow various nerves and blood vessels to get in and out of the area of the eyeball. Why do we need so many nerves in the area of the eyeball? Well, we need one nerve for vision, and then we need three more nerves, and those three more nerves are simply moving the eyeball around because they are innervating the muscles that move the eyeball around. So we've got four nerves in the eye socket just dedicated to the eye. And in addition, there are other nerves that go through that area whose job is to give us sensation on the top of the head. And another one that comes out down here, see these two little holes right here? They give us sensation on the cheeks. Let's talk about nerves a little bit more by opening up the skull. I'll show you what's inside. Okay, so inside, let's see if we can get this oriented right. Here we go. We're looking inside the skull. And what you notice is there's a big hole over here. This hole over here is for the spinal cord to go out. The rest of the inside of this is simply where the brain sits. So really, the skull is a giant helmet. It's a big suitcase for the brain. So if you fall down and you hit your head, this is what's keeping your brain from mushing. So why do you need a helmet? Well, if you're just walking around, you don't need a helmet. You're already wearing one. But if you're going to drive in a car at 65 miles an hour and have a crash, well, then you need a little more protection because this skull isn't going to be enough. So most of us aren't going to wear helmets when we drive because we're not speed racers, but that's what airbags are all about, is to keep your head from hitting the windshield or the steering wheel so that you don't crack this beautiful helmet that's all around the brain that has not evolved for high-speed collisions. But the brain has all of these nerves that go in and out of it. The nerves coming in are bringing in sensory information, like vision, like smell, taste, Hearing. And what other sense? How many senses do we have? We have six. We have six. So we've got vision, smell, taste, hearing, touch, and the one everyone forgets, which is balance. We have a sense of balance. 
Now, five of the six of these are uniquely coming out of the brain. <laughs> All the ones that we call special senses are the ones that tell us about the world that we need a special organ to tell us about this world. So we need the eye to tell us about vision. We need the ears to tell us about hearing. We need the ears to tell us about balance, too, because balance is actually inside the area of your ear. That tells you which way is up, which way is down, with your tilted sideways. That's how you can tell on an airplane, even with your eyes closed, that you're banking a turn. That's your sense of balance that's being activated. Okay? We need a tongue for tasting, and we need, of course, our nose for smelling. But the sense of touch isn't unique to the nerves coming in and out of the brain. The sense of touch is everywhere in the body. So that's a general sense. So we have five special senses and one general sense. So we have six senses. And I'm not counting ESP and all that other stuff, okay? We have six normal, regular senses. Five special ones and one general one of touch. But even though it's general, it's not simple. Because the sense of touch is everywhere in the body. And it not only tells you that you touch something, it can tell you what its texture is or how squishy it is or how hot it is, or how cold it is, or whether it tickles you, or whether it gives you pain. So all of these are part of touch sensation. So it's a complicated sense, even though we have it everywhere in our body. So most of the nerves that tell us about our world or control our uh, actions of our world are going in and out from the brain, which is our control center. And so if you look at the bottom, you see all these different holes in the skull. There's a bunch of holes, all these holes in here. Many of these holes are carrying nerves in and out of the brain. So the very bottom of the skull, which is all, where all these holes are, has to be well formed. Otherwise, we would pinch off some of these nerves, and, and there's also blood vessels going in and out. That support our uh, being able to tell the world, or tell our, our body what the world is doing through senses, or being able to control our body by controlling muscular actions. The rest of it is basically a suitcase. So if you look at the top of the skull, there's no holes here. Because there's no nerves coming in and out of the top of your head. You don't need them. It's all coming out of the bottom. Okay, so let's stop talking about the skull. Let's talk about some of the other bones of the body. Actually, before I do, I've got two more skulls here. I forgot. Let me show you these skulls first. So we were talking about the teeth, right? So here, conveniently, this one's jaws now separated for me. Let's take a look at this one. Okay, so this skull, can you see it? Can you tell how old this skull is? It's really hard because there's no teeth. Okay, let's take a look just at the top here and the bottom. See, there's, there's no teeth. I know it's a little hard to see this, but this is the top jaw right here, and there are no teeth here. And if we look at this bottom jaw, let's compare it to this one that we saw before. There's clearly no teeth on this one. So what happens when you have no teeth? Well, probably the person's very old. We know that, because most of us, you know, we have our teeth when you're young, eventually they get old, and the teeth might fall out, and they might get rotten, and they might get worn down. What ends up happening is the jaw itself actually gets smaller. So take a look at this jaw. See how thick it is right here? It has to be strong because there are muscles pulling on it to allow these teeth to grind and chew. But once you can't do that anymore, the muscles don't really have a job to do anymore because you're not chewing up stuff. So guess what? The bone that supports the muscles gets weaker and weaker. And you end up with a jaw that becomes quite thin. If you look at this, it's actually quite narrow right here because there are no more teeth here. So this part of the jaw is really, really narrow because it's lost the teeth. So if you've ever seen somebody who looks like they're sucking in their lips like over their jaw and they have no teeth, well, they probably have very little jaw left as well because they're not supporting teeth, so they're not chewing, so they're not using those muscles that pull on the bone. Bone is very, very responsive to muscles. And it's very responsive to pressure forces. Anyone here ever have braces? Raise your hand if you ever had braces. Okay, a lot more than the vegetarian system. Okay, so if you've had braces, you know that you can move teeth around inside bone. 
So moving teeth involves putting some pressure on it by putting a belt around the tooth and then rubber bands or little pieces of metal that tighten it and it pulls on the tooth. When you pull that tooth, as you pull the tooth against the bone, the bone in front of the tooth starts to dissolve because of the pressure on it. And the bone behind the tooth actually fills in with more bone because otherwise it would just leave a hole behind. And the tooth moves towards where you're pulling it by absorbing the bone in front and reforming it behind. And if you did a time lapse of the tooth moving in bone, it would look like a cork floating in water. It just moves very fluidly through the bone. Because the bone, at any snapshot at one point in time, looks hard. But over time, it's actually quite flexible and responds very well to pressures. So as you pull a tooth, it resorbs in front and reforms behind. And that means that the bone, over a long period of time, is acting like water. It just moves out of the way for the tooth to come through like a boat and then reforms behind it again. But any one second in time when you look at it, it's hard at that moment. So that resorbing and reforming takes time to do, but it shows us that bone is very dynamic. It's always moving, it's always changing. People who do a lot of bodybuilding build up lots of strong projections on their bones because their muscles are really big. And the bigger the muscle, the more surface area that muscle needs to attach to the bone. So when you look at the bones, you can tell if someone is very muscular by how big the projections are on the bone that the muscles need to attach all that surface area. Let's take a look at this skull. This is a really interesting skull. We might need a little bit more light so we can see this. Do we turn on the overhead lights here? What I'm trying to show you, let's see if that will adjust. I hope it will. On the base of the skull, there it is. Right over here. See these two things? You're pointing to right here. One here, and there's another one here. Here's the hole where the spinal cord goes into the brain, right? But this bone right here that I'm outlining with my fingers is actually a neck bone that got stuck to the bottom of the skull on this person. This person has what we call a pathology. It means there's some disease process going on. And in this case, the neck bone has fused to the base of the skull, right over here. So this is the neck bone over here. This should not be stuck to the skull normally. Let me show you what a neck bone is supposed to look like. So here's a whole string of backbones, right? These go like this. And the very top of it looks like this. Okay, so for this, we'll probably have to shut the lights back down again because these white bones are too bright. Thank you. So if we look at this skull in the bottom, it just has the big hole. What we were seeing on the other skull was this bone here got stuck to it. So if we put this bone in its place, just like that, that's what we were seeing on the other skull. This bone was just stuck to the base of the skull. But normally, this bone is able to move because right over here is what we call a synovial joint. It's a joint with fluid in it that allows lots of movement. Your knee, for example, has fluid inside it. If it gets injured, it gets a little too much fluid. You get something called water on the knee. But the reason that these joints move is that there's fluid and it moves in a fluid base. And the surfaces that roll against each other are covered with a smooth surface called cartilage. It's kind of like a Teflon coating on a pan. So you know how a fried egg doesn't stick to Teflon? So the surfaces of the cartilage can glide against each other because they're really smooth. And so we have cartilage on either side on these two surfaces, and then some fluid bathing that area so it's lubricated, kind of like machine oil that allows the machines to move very, very fluidly without scraping. And that goes against this part of the skull right here. And because of that, we can actually roll this back and forth like this. See how it's rolling on that surface? So that little rocker bottom is where we do this movement, the yes movement of our head. So if you go like this with your head, move it up and down, you're moving at that joint. What if you want to do the no movement? The way you do the no movement is you bring in the next bone in the neck, which is this one right here. 
And this bone is interesting because it has a big point sticking out. See that point over here? This point here used to belong to this vertebra. So we call a backbone a vertebra. And if they're in the neck region, we call it a cervical vertebra. The cervix is the word for neck. And this little bump started out being part of that bone. But it then fused to the one underneath. So these two bones fit together just like that. See that? And because this part separated off of the first one and stuck to the second one, it forms an axis around which this can swivel. See how I'm swiveling it back and forth? That's how you do the no movement, by swiveling the first vertebra against the second one. So if you move your head left and right, that's what you're doing. You are moving it, the first vertebra against the second. So these first two vertebrae have special names. The first vertebra is called atlas. Anyone remember what Atlas was? It's a Greek mythological person. Yes, you're raising your hand. Who's Atlas? Was he the Titan that was doomed to hold up the world? Yes! And I don't know if you all heard what he said, but he said Atlas holds up the world. And that's true. Well, we don't know if it's true. It's true that the mythology is that Atlas held up the world. So we call this first vertebra Atlas as if it were holding up the world, and the world in this case being represented by the round skull. So that's how we remember the first vertebra's name is Atlas, because it's holding up the world of the skull. The second one has this point sticking up around which Atlas can rotate. So this point sticking up forms an axis of rotation. So its name is Axis. So we have Atlas and Axis. And they're the only two vertebrae that had names. After that, they just get numbered. So they're much more boring. So let's look at the rest of them. So this is vertebra number three, number four, number five, number six, bless you, and number seven. So all together we have seven vertebra in the neck region. And that is a formula that's true for all mammals. All mammals have seven neck bones. How many bones are in the neck of a giraffe? Seven. Seven. They're just really long. How many bones are in the neck of a whale? Seven. They're just really short. Because if you look at a whale, it basically goes from head to body, right? <laughs> but there is actually a neck there, but the bones are very, very flat against each other. So when you're looking at any of the neck bones, there's one feature they all have in common. They all have these little holes right here. See these little holes? Every single one of them has a little hole on the side. So whenever we see that little hole, we know that we are looking at a neck bone. And there are some blood vessels that run through those holes that go up to the skull or from the skull to feed the area of the, the head. And so they are another blood supply into the skull to help supply the brain. And that only happens in these vertebrae. Once you get to the chest, <coughs> excuse me, once you get to the chest, we don't have those holes anymore because that blood vessel is already branched off of what it came from. So it's not going to go through all the rest of the bones. So when we see a bone that looks like this, and these two look very similar, don't they? But this one doesn't have that hole. So we know this is not a neck bone anymore. Now one thing all the neck bones have in common besides that hole is that they all turn left-right relative to each other. So they all are helping us to and swivel our head to the left and right. We do most of it between the atlas and axis. But the rest of it also happens through the rest of our neck. So that turning from side to side, the way we do that mostly is a big muscle in the front of your neck. You can maybe see it on your neighbor. Watch your neighbor turn your neck, okay? You look at each other, watch, and you'll see a big muscle come out on the neck on either side. It takes a V shape. This muscle is pulling from the back of the skull. So the neck bones are making an axis, and you're pulling from the back of the skull like this. So if I pull from the back of my skull, behind my ear on my right side, the muscle that's pulling comes to the very front of my breastbone, like that, and it sticks out on this side of my neck, but I'm looking the other way. If I want to look this way, I have to pull the muscle from this side. The muscle on the opposite side of the head pulls your face to the side you want to look at. So from the opposite side, it pulls you where you want to look. So you can feel that on yourself as you turn your head from side to side. Feel that neck muscle pulling, pulling your head from left to right. Then we get 
to these bones. Now, these are the bones of the chest region, and we call them thoracic backbones or thoracic vertebrae. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And that's the end of them. And these bones really change in shape as we go from the first ones to the last ones. I'm going to try and get them all in here so you can see them all. Okay, you ready to see them all? These are all thoracic vertebrae. Now what these all have in common is something that all mammals can do. We just bend forward and backwards like this. Right? So if you move your spine like you're swimming like a dolphin, or imagine a horse running and its spine is, is going sort of up and down as it's running, that up and down motion is a motion that mammals do. If you watch a lizard running, its body is going side to side. A lizard, and most reptiles, crocodiles, alligators, iguanas, they run as if they were fish swimming out of water. Just add legs because they don't have water, and the legs help them move on the ground. Or you can take away the legs and they would move just like a snake. A snake also moves side to side like a fish swimming out of water. Fish don't swim in an up and down movement, but whales and dolphins do. They swim in an up and down movement because they're mammals. So when we evolved in our ancient history from a fish-like animal to a reptile-like animal, we still kept the side to side motion. And that side-to-side -side motion is actually coming from these back bones here that are very, very old. So they can, they can move forward and back, but they are better at moving side-to-side -side because their attachments here and here, see them like that, can swivel against each other like that. So that swiveling to side-to-side -side allows you not only to go forward and back, but also side-to-side. -side. And you're better at doing side-to-side -side motions, like a snake, with these bones. But you can also separate them this way. See, you separate them that way. And when you separate them, you can go forward. But there's a limit to how far back you can go, because these bones here are going to hit each other. See that? They touch each other. And when they hit each other, that's as far back as you can go. So if we stack these all up, you get some idea of the lack of flexibility of the back. We can only go about that far because they're all hitting each other. If we really want to move backward, we need to use the next set of bones, which are lumbar bones. <coughs> so, moving like a fish, or like a snake, or like a lizard is happening with these chest bones. Add to it the neck bones, the seven mammalian neck bones that allow you to twist the head, we've added a lot more motion to the body movement compared to what a lizard does, or a snake does. But if we really want to get to the galloping, the up and down movement, we need a little more flexibility than this. So most of the rest of the flexibility is coming from here. And these are the bones of the lumbar region. This is the lower back, where the small of your back is, where it curves in. You may have a little bit of sway back there, right before your butt. That's this part right here. So let's move these out of the way and show you these guys. These are the lumbar vertebrae. They're big and fat and chunky, but they curl backwards much more easily because their spines are a lot shorter. And so they can bend back like this, or if I turn up like the other one was. See that? They have quite a bit of curvature in here before the bones hit each other. So this is where you get a lot of the, the forward and back motion. You can do some of it with your thorax, but most of it's actually bending near the hip and moving backward like this. So that's where the galloping motion comes in, and that's what separates us, because alligators and lizards and snakes, they can't do that. They don't have that up and down motion, except maybe a few of the pythons that can coil their body around things. So they're a little bit better at it, but that's flexibility mostly from here, from these guys over here. That's a little bit of this flexibility for them, because they're going forward, so the spines are separating. But a snake has trouble going backward against itself because of those spines. But we can do it. We can do it a lot better because these have much shorter spines on them. Now, why are lumbar vertebrae so fat? Look at the body of that one. 
See how big and fat and round it is? Let's turn it up, right side up like that. Okay? Let's compare that to one from the, the chest region, like this one over here. These are all strung together, so it's hard to separate them. Let's see if I can separate it like that. There's a huge difference here. So why is that one so big? Because this one has to carry your body weight. It's like the bottom of a pyramid. Right? Pyramids have a very wide bottom, and they get smaller as they go towards the top. The same thing with your spine, because it's carrying so much weight. It starts out really heavy at the bottom, and then it gets really small as it gets to the top because there's less and less weight being carried. And because these ones at the bottom have to carry so much weight, they actually have to move in toward the middle of your body to be a good support column. So the swaying in your back pushes these vertebra towards the middle of your body so they can actually be a support column in the middle of your body, holding the weight. Because if they were only in the back, you, you tend to fall forward. So by pushing them in towards the middle, that's why your back is indented. You now can carry that weight more easily all around these vertebrae. Okay. Another feature of these thoracic vertebrae, we're going back to the ones in the chest, that you don't see on the lumbar vertebra, is that they can support ribs. So when we look at thoracic vertebra, maybe you can see it right over here, there's a little corrugation on the side of the vertebra here and here. And those little corrugations are where ribs are attaching to the vertebra. Let me go grab a rib and let's see what they look like next to these vertebrae. Taking the two last ribs, <coughs> and they actually attach like this, right down here like that. So these ribs are attaching on the body of the vertebra, a little bit between the two like that, and then they have a little part that attaches up here, this little projection that's sticking out of the vertebra towards you. And this part that sticks out toward you is called the transverse process. So if you take a vertebra, like this one. Look at it this way. You can see this transverse process on either side. You get a rib that matches that one. And if you match up this rib to this vertebra, it actually sits just like that. So it has a piece where it attaches next to the body where my thumb is and has another part that attaches over here on the transverse process, right over here where my index finger is pointing, right there. So there's two points to stabilize the rib, but the rib still moves because it also has a synovial joint. So ribs are kind of like bucket handles or pail handles, so they can swing up and down. It's hard to do this on this document camera because it's slow to focus. But imagine when you take a breath in, your chest goes up, right? Take a deep breath. And feel the ribs come up, and then let it out. And feel the ribs go down again. So the ribs are swinging up and down like this, like bucket handles, and they're helping to keep your chest the size it needs to be when you're breathing. So we've got 12 thoracic vertebrae, and we have 12 ribs. And ribs can be really tiny, like this one. This is the last rib, which we also call the floating rib or the false rib. They can be pretty long, like this one over here, which barely fits on our document camera, like that. Or they can be short and stocky, like the very, very first rib that's way up here, at the very top of your chest. And that one's shape looks like this. So, depending on which rib you're looking at, the different shapes tell us where in the vertebral column these various ribs would attach. And there's all different shapes in there, but they basically start out short, start out short and curved. Then they get longer and slender, then they stay slender, and then they get short again. And that's how they move from the top to the bottom of the rib cage. Okay, let's move ribs out of the way. Let's talk about some of the other fun bones. Oh, I forgot to show you this. Before I do that, this is super cool. This is a set of bones from the thoracic region of a person who had a condition called scoliosis, which is when the spine is curved. I don't know if you can see that or not, but if I turn this like this, maybe you can see these bones are actually making a curve. Let's turn it over here like this. Can you see how they're curving like that? 
So this person is very twisted like this during life because the bones on this side all fused together and got stuck like that. So their whole body is in a twist like that. You saw that these bones are supposed to move. They're supposed to have some real joints to allow movement. So you should swing from side to side or forward to back. But here, this person couldn't do it anymore because all of this part of the bone has become very, very fused. So it's really stiff and stuck in this curved position. Okay, let's talk about some other connections in bones. Okay, let's go to these. This is the breastbone. And why does it have this clear stuff on either side? Because this isn't actually bone. This is actually cartilage. So this is what's connecting these ribs that are coming around from the back, like this, to the breastbone. So the only part that's actually bone is the white part in the middle. So this sits right over the middle of the chest. Anyone here learn how to do CPR? So this is what you're compressing. You compress on this to push against the heart. You have to actually press this so this becomes a piston and pushes in against the heart to get the heart started again. So that's our breastbone. And then connected to the breastbone is this very interesting S-shaped bone. This is the skeleton. But this looks like the old-fashioned key that had a little flag on the end of it and you turn and you put it into a key hole and then you twist it like that so it has the big fat part over here that turns inside. So they thought this looked like an old-fashioned skeleton key so they named it the key bone. The clavicle is the key bone. And this bone attaches like this against, I'm oh, sorry, it goes on the sternum. Okay, it goes like that on the sternum to a bone that looks kind of like a spade that you dig with, right? This looks like a very big shovel. And so they named it the shovel bone. But the scapula sticks on your back kind of like this. See that? These are the scapula, like little angel wings on your back. <laughs> and this scapula would attach, so remember this is on the back, okay? It would attach right over here from this point, right there, you see it? There you go, like that, back to the breastbone like this. And this is how the upper extremity stays attached to the rest of the skeleton, because the whole rest of your upper arm is actually not attached to the rest of your skeleton. It's all free-floating. The scapula is free-floating on the back. It's only attached by muscles. The very top of it, right over here, is called the acromion. And that means the high point, kind of like the word Acropolis. The Acropolis was a, a Greek temple on the highest point in Greece. So it was called the Acropolis, the high point of the city. And that's what this is. This is the high point on the shoulders, Acropolis. Okay, let's move the shoulders out of the way. Let's move on to... Okay, this bone may or may not fit. Oh, it barely fits. We're not that it'll fit better. This bone is called the humerus. Of course, we've got left and right, so I'll grab one here and show you one here. This bone is right over here. This is an arm bone. And the humerus is what allows the shoulder to move back and forth. It's got a really big ball joint right here. And that ball joint attaches like this, so it can swing back and forth against the scapula. So that actually is a very open joint. We'll see later that our pelvis has a very different kind of joint. But this gives us a lot of mobility. So if you try to move your shoulder around, right, you can do this, you can do all these different motions. But what's interesting is if you hold your shoulder, you're holding it, if you hold it, right, the scapula here, you're holding that acropolis that I told you about, the acromion. So if you put your hand and hold your shoulder, and try to lift your arm up, but don't hit your neighbor, okay? You'll find that you can only lift your arm this high until you let go. If you let go, then you can bring it up all the way. Because this part that sticks out over the top is actually preventing the movement. You know, you put this over here. Preventing the movement of this bone any further. So it's very interesting how it limits the movement. And the reason it limits the movement is to try and give some stability to the shoulder joint. Now why is this called the humerus? Because it's fun. It's not because of the fun, which is funny, right? So it's humerus. It's actually called the humerus because the word humor has to do with this having a body and a connection to the shoulder. 
So Umar was actually the derivative of the word shoulder. But if we look at the very bottom of the humerus, where it attaches to this bone, this is our elbow joint, right there. And right in your elbow joint, if you put your finger in your elbow, like this, put your finger in your elbow, bend it, your finger pops out. Extend it, there's a groove there where you can get your nails of your, your hand right in there. If you bang that on a table, or it hurts, right? Why is that? Why do you call banging on a funny bone? Because it's funny. Because why? There's a nerve in there. That's right. There's a nerve in there. And the nerve that's in there is named for the same bone it's running next to. It's the ulnar nerve. And this bone here is called the ulna. And so, yes, it's the funny bone. It's not really bone. It's a nerve. But it's under our humerus, which is funny. So it's humerus. So it's the funny bone. But it also feels funny. Then there's a little bone right next to it. See this one over here? So, so while the ulna does the hinge joint, this one over here actually has a really round head. And that round head, you see how it's round, like a little cup on top? This round head rolls back and forth over here. And this is the bone that allows you to turn your palms up and down. So if you bend your elbows, put your hands in front of you, and roll your palms up and down, that's the bone that's rolling around to do that. And by rolling back and forth, if you did it in cross-section, you would be describing an arc of a circle. So we call that bone the radius because it connects from the center point out to the end of the circle and describes the arc of a circle. So this bone is called radius because it will cross over. So if we look at our articulated skeleton, you can see it's all attached together. Here's the elbow joint, right? So that's ulna. But watch this bone over here. If I roll it over like that, you see that it crosses over. And now the hand is turned. If I unroll it, the hand is out like that. See, this is the thumb. The thumb is out like a hitchhiking. Now if I turn it this way, now the thumb is inwards. So this is describing a circle as it goes back and forth. That arc means that the connection between these two is a radius. So we call this a radius. Now, we've got this connection in here. Here's our hips, and look at this socket in here, it's really big. That's a much more stable connection compared to what we saw on the upper extremity. So here are the hip bones, right, we put these two together. Looks kind of like a mask, right? <laughs> but the eyes on this mask are looking at the floor. That's the actual real position of pelvis. I'm not facing forward like this, like you see in all the Halloween decorations. It's actually with the eyes looking at the floor. They're not really eyes, of course, but I, I do like this mask. If I really want to make the rest of this helmet, I gotta add the tailbone, right? This is the part in the back. So then, now I'm now I'm a hip head, right? Everyone said I was a hipster. So this is the sacred bone, the sacred bone. After all, it's very holy. Look, it's got a lot of holes in it. True. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you like it. Don't come. Okay, so there we go. Lots of holes in the sacred bone. These are also for nerves coming in and out. But the very end of the sacred bone is here. This is the tail bone. This little part of the end is all we have for a tail. Right? It's not much. That's called the coccyx, this little part of the end. But if we add the two hip bones to it, now, all together, this whole thing, which is not going to fit under a document camera for sure, but that whole thing is the pelvis. And we can tell the sex of a person by looking at the front part of this pelvis. If the two parts are very close together, and the upside down V shape that I'm outlining with my thumb right now, this part over here, if this upside down V shape is very narrow, it's a male. If it's very wide apart, which I, I have to ignore officially because this is actually a male pelvis, but if I were to open it up like this and it were articulated this way, that would be a female. Females have a very wide V shape because it has to have a very large opening here for the head of the baby to come out. So the birth canal is determined by how open this bottom part is. Let's talk about this little joint right over here. See that little thing? That big cuff? 
That's a lot more stable compared to the joint we saw in the upper extremity with the shoulder, with the scapula. What's this called? Anyone know? Femur. Femur. <laughs> what happens if I do this and I put this in the middle of it? That's the pirate symbol, isn't it? That's it. This is the pirate symbol. Or the toxic symbol, right? Like poison control center has this on the, all the medicines, right? So, this is called a femur or a thigh bone. This is the biggest bone. It was actually sometimes used as a, as a hammer or a club, you can see, because it has this nice big ball end on it. It could be a weapon. You could use this to really knock someone out. <coughs> but, look how it fits in here. It's a perfect ball and socket. So that gives us a really stable position for moving our lower extremity without dislocating it. It's much easier to dislocate a shoulder than it is to dislocate a hip. Because the hip is a very deep socket that's holding a lot of weight. Okay, let's take our, our femur and move it down. We will never fit this whole femur under here. But in the very bottom of the femur is where the knee joint is. So let's grab some knee joint pieces here. Here we go. So to finish our knee joint, we have to add this bone right over here. See that? This is called the tibia. This is called the femur or thigh bone. This is called the tibia or shin bone. And if you feel the very front of your leg down here, by the way, leg is only from the knee down. Like a chicken leg is just the drum bone. The thigh is a different part, okay? So leg is not the whole extremity. It's just from the knee down. And if you feel the front of your leg, you'll feel the bone right in front. There's muscle on the side. Go to the outside, you feel muscle. Go to the inside, very inside, you feel muscle. But right in the front, it's sharp and it's hard. That's the shin bone. That's this one right here. And right next to that shin bone, on the outside, this is the inside part, this is the outside part, is this bone over here. This bone is called the fibula. Let's move it down a little bit. I'm not sure if this document camera can expand anymore. Let's see. Yes, it does. Okay, let's try that. <coughs> oh, see, good, we did it all in. Look at that. Okay, so there is a tibia and a fibula. I love this word, fibula. Fibula means perone. And perone means pin. Because this is a little bone, like in a chicken leg, that little sharp pointy one that's really annoying that you can use like a toothpick. That little sharp bone or pin bone was used to pin togas in place. So it was called a pin bone. And so when the Romans wore a toga, and, you know, the little twist, the little knot up here, they used to pin it so it wouldn't unknot, otherwise they'd end up being naked. So that little pin bone was really important for keeping the toga together. That's this bone over here, only ours isn't as sharp at the bottom. And right at the bottom, it makes a little edge where it nests against the ankle. This bone on the side is the bone that lies. It's fibbing. It's not really carrying the weight. All the weight's on the tibia. So we say it's the fibbing bone, or fibula. It doesn't really mean lie, but it helps you remember the name, that this one is not carrying all the weight. And right below that would be the ankle bone. So let's bring these over. Here's the one from the other side. Okay. And right over here at the very bottom, we put this together. See that? It makes a little cup right around the ankle. So we can move the ankle up and down like this. See that? Now higher up over here, we have a little bone here called the patella or kneecap bone. Now this is a really important bone. It's actually a bone that forms inside a tendon of the quadriceps muscle, which is the big muscle that, that pulls on your thigh over here. So the large muscle here, and it goes right to the kneecap. And the reason for that patella inside that tendon is to take that tendon around and move it off of the femur and then insert it back on the tibia so it's actually acting like a pulley. It's turning the tendon in a loop. Any of you take physics? Who here's taking any physics? 
You learn about pulleys versus levers? Okay, some of you haven't had this yet. Okay, so a lever is like a seesaw. You have the, the long arm of the seesaw, they've got the fulcrum as the part where it balances in the middle. And the longer the seesaw arm is, the easier it is to lift the weight on the other side. So we have a seesaw, and we also have a pulley in our ankle region, but in our knee region, we only have the pulley. The pulley is when you put the rope through, you pull on one side, and the rope is actually pulling the weight from the other side. So if you pull down on the rope, the weight goes up because the rope is turning around the pulley. That's what's happening here with the patella, the rope or the tendon, the muscles turning around the pulley to go into the tibia. So when I pull this muscle, pull it up towards my hip, it pulls the tibia out so I can kick. If I didn't have a patella, then this muscle would insert directly on the tibia and it would simply pull my tibia up towards the femur, but it wouldn't let me kick it out. So I need to actually move the tendon so that it pulls out like this. Like I'm pulling it in front, like this, to kick out. I do that by pulling around the pulley. But when I get to the ankle, the ankle works a little bit differently. So down, we put our ankle, I'm just going to show one side so it's easier. Okay. I put my ankle together like this. Your ankle. There we go. We can see this bone sticking out over here. So I'm going to turn it to the front, you can see it sticking out. This forms a pulley also, and there are tendons that move around this, like this, and go down into the foot. So they come from here, and they turn the corner, and they go into the foot. And they pull the foot downward. Let's push this up a little bit. Okay, there we go. So now, we can have these muscles pull around here like this, and pull the foot down. So this is acting like a pulley. So if you look at your ankle, the part that sticks out on the side, here and here, that your sneakers have to cut around, right, to go around it, that ankle part that sticks out is a pulley, because tendons go around it, and they change the angle at which they insert. But in addition, you actually have this lever arm. You have this part sticking out here. This is called the calcaneus. And this is a giant lever arm. So the calf muscle attaches here with a tendon called the Achilles tendon. You know the story of Achilles? Yes. His mother held him by his heel and dipped him in the river Styx so that he would be immortal. But because she was covering the heel, that part was not immortal. So he died when an arrow hit his area. Now, did he die because an arrow actually hit his heel bone? Probably not. Probably it went right above and it cut the Achilles tendon and left a big opening here. And either he bled out, because there's some big blood vessels there, or he got infected, because remember, these guys are running around in sandals, there's horseshit everywhere, excuse me, there's horseshit <laughs> everywhere, and it probably got into the wound, and caused some infection, and that made the cow who died. Yeah, I didn't say that word. Right? So, <clears throat> hey, come on, you guys are used to fertilizer around here, right? <laughs> okay, so this, this is the toy. Excuse me, this is, the, this is the lever arm. And how do we know it's a really good lever arm? Let's compare it to our elbow joint. Let's go back to our elbow joint. Remember this one over here? Look at our elbow joint. There's a lever arm on the elbow joint. That's pretty wimpy. Which is why it's so much harder for me to do a push-up, right? Because I don't have much of a lever arm here. But it's really easy for me to bounce up and down my toes because I'm using that really big lever of the calcaneus, of the heel bone. Okay, one last thing, because I think I'm almost out of time now. One last thing. What is more advanced, a hand or a foot? Wow, raise your hand if you think it's a hand. Raise your hand if you think it's a foot. The feet have it. True, the foot is actually evolutionarily more advanced than the hand. All primates have hands. They have hands on their hands, and they have feet that look like hands. But only humans have this beautifully configured shape with an arch in it that actually can support your weight, allow you to run long distances or walk long distances with this spring-loaded system inside here. So there are arches in here. Anyone who has fallen arches or flat feet usually can get out of being in the army, okay? Right? If you have, who has flat feet? 
Wow, a lot of you are not going to do military service. Okay, because it can't stand in attention for a long time because you have to use muscle energy to maintain the arch on your foot. Someone who doesn't have to use that muscle energy can last a longer time on their feet without getting tired because they're letting ligaments that hold the foot in this arch maintain the arch shape, which allows them to push off with their toes, like that, from the ground, so that they can get a nice long stride as they're running. So those of you who wear high heeled shoes, you're running around like T-Rex like this, with all your weight like this. T-Rex walked on his toes. If you want to be a dinosaur, wear high heeled shoes. If you want to use your foot to the way it was adapted, get off the high heeled shoes and let your natural arch take the weight and your standing ability will be much better. Your toes won't start turning in and crunching and all those weird things. So the foot is a wonderful, very advanced design compared to the hand, which is pretty cool as it is, but not as advanced as our foot. Okay, I'm going to stop with that and see if there are any questions. Anybody have any questions? Thank you.